So today I'm going to be talking about uh, philosophy and thought experiments. Um, and uh, as I was discussing uh, last time, um, of course, experiments um, play a central role in the success of modern natural science. And, and that's what one of the reasons uh, for which the, the scientific uh, revolution uh, has created um, what I called a, a crisis of uh, philosophical uh, method or uh, one time created. Um, and so it's relevant uh, to talk about uh, whether philosophy has got anything um, similar to experiments in natural science. Do, do experiments play any role uh, in uh, philosophy. Now, oh. one um, role that they that they do play um, is is a relatively straightforward one, and and in fact just involves the the same experiments that that science does. Here, uh, some people said your slides that not show it. Oh. Um, I. Oh, uh, some people you also said uh, retroactively uh, said I can see the slide. Maybe yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe sure? our regular. Is it is it okay now? Because I because I'm uh, it it all seems. I mean I, I'm I'm sh sharing my screen and. Um, I can, and the slide seems is perfectly normal, so I'm not sure what is different this time. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, so I, continue, shall I can, okay, I'll continue. Yeah, okay. I, 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 as far as I can see, it's it's all it's all just the same as as usual. So maybe they have they have some problem in connecting. Um, but if there's something I can I can do, <laughs> you tell. Um, so one of the things that I argued in lecture one was that all scientific uh, knowledge um, is part of the evidence base for philosophy because all knowledge um, is part of that evidence uh, base. There's, there's no requirement on philosophy that um, its evidence has to be purely a priori, purely the result of some kind of ref um, reflection um, independent of experience or anything like that. Um, and Look at contemporary uh, philosophy. Uh, you you see that uh, it does uh, draw on natural science in various uh, ways. So, for example, um, w when we're discussing the the philosophy of space and time, it, it's would be very natural to to draw on. Uh, theories in physics, such as Einstein's theory of special relativity, there's there's no there's no bar on doing that, and and in fact you can see in debates on issues in metaphysics, um, for example, about um, whether only the present is is real, that people appeal to uh, special relativity, um, and uh, similarly in the philosophy of perception, it's quite normal uh, for uh, philosophers to to draw on um, theories in psychology, and th these theories from physics or psychology or whatever branch of science is relevant, um, they themselves are supported by experimental evidence, of course. Um, so uh, indirectly, uh, the, the philosophical theories which draw on them are are using. Um, the experimental evidence, because they're using theories that are based on that experimental evidence, um, and and so in in that sense, um, it, there's a, clear, a fairly clear though indirect uh, way uh, in which many philosophical theories are are drawing on uh, experimental evidence, but. What I what I want to to talk about today is more to do with whether um, 
there are experiments which are done by uh, philosophers uh, themselves rather than just as we're using other people's uh, experiments. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, an, uh, an obvious uh, thing to, to say is that um, most philosophers don't, as it were, do, do what you might call real e experiments, the kind that require, for example, a laboratory or something like that. Um, philosophers are much more likely to do uh, thought experiments. Um, and um, th these thought experiments uh, have a, a very a very long history. So in Western philosophy, um, thought experiments go back at least to uh, to Plato. Uh, so for example, he 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 talks about Gaiji's a uh, ring of invisibility, um, a ring when you wear it, it makes you uh, invisible and um, about whether uh, people who had such a, a ring would um, would behave uh, morally or bec because they could escape punishment if, if they did if they did wrong. Um, so that's already a, a thought experiment. Um, in, in a, I guess in a way, um, uh, concerning uh, psychology as well as uh, philosophy. But um, I mean, there are many, many such uh, examples throughout the, the history of Western philosophy, but it's not only Western philosophy. philosophy. So for example, um, thought experiments uh, also figure in ancient Indian uh, philosophy. Um, for those of you who, who know about um, the thought experiments in epistemology by Edmund Gedier, uh, there are actually um, forerunners of those uh, thought experiments uh, which uh, were known in, in ancient um, Indian philosophy. Um, and um, I'm, I'm interested to hear at some point uh, perhaps about um, whether thought experiments played a role in um, ancient uh, Chinese philosophy. I mean, it seems that uh, various kinds of stories or fables were um, significant there, and, and perhaps some of those played the role of, of thought experiments. I'm not sure, but it'd be interesting to hear from somebody who knows um, more about ancient Chinese philosophy than I do, which is very easy to do. Um, so... Thought experiments are now a, a standard technique in contemporary analytic philosophy. Um, and I mean, they play various different roles, but one role is often to provide uh, counterexamples to, to generalizations. Um, but it, we shouldn't be thinking of these um, thought experiments as... Um, as something that is distinctive just of uh, philosophy because it, uh, thought experiments are also quite uh, common uh, in uh, natural science. And in fact, I think the phrase thought experiment used to be used mainly about the scientific ones rather than the philosophical ones. Um, so for ex Galileo used a thought experiment to argue against Aristotle's uh, theory of motion. Um, and Einstein asked what would happen if you rode um, on a, a, a light beam. Um, so those, those are thought experiments which played, which played some role in the, the history of, of physics. Um, but it's certainly puzzling at first to understand how thought experiments uh, work. Um, so... If, you, if you're concerned, let's say, with a generalization like all swans are white, and you actually find a black swan in Tasmania or, or wherever, um, then, of course, that black swan is a counterexample to the generalization that you're interested in. Um, but if you simply imagine a black swan, you, You've imagined a counterexample to all swans are white, but you don't actually have a counterexample to all swans are white. So, so what exactly is supposed to be the role of uh, imagining uh, here? Um, well, I think one obvious 
point um, is that if we were concerned not just with the generalization that all swans are white, which is simply a generalization about as were swans in the actual world, if if we were concerned um, with a a necessitated generalization, like the one saying that necessarily all swans are white, um, then maybe um, imagining a black swan would give you a counterexample because it might somehow give you an argument for the possibility uh, of uh, black swans. And if, if a black swan is possible, then it's not true that necessarily all swans are white. Um, but, we, but we need to be clearer about um, what that uh, connection is between imagination and uh, possibility. Um, and, and that's just an aspect of a more general question, which is what is the cognitive role of imagination? Um, and when we ask that, I think it's useful to uh, to take on a distinction which uh, is well known in the philosophy of of science and was made by Hans uh, Reichenbach, um, who distinguished between the context of discovery and the context of justification. So the context of discovery is the context in which an idea is first uh, thought of, while the context of justification is the context in which the idea's correctness is tested. So, um, I mean, for example, um, you might you might first think of an idea um, when when you were drunk, um, and or um, it might even come to um, in a dream when you're asleep. Um, but it seems that, that when, when, once you've got the idea, you still need to test whether it's actually correct or not. And, and that's not something which you should be doing when you're, when you're drunk or asleep. It seems um, that's a stage at which you need your full powers of uh, rationality. Um, so I think what is easy to agree and obvious um, is, is that the Im imagination plays a central role in the context of discovery. Um, a, you know, a scientist with no imagination is, is obviously not going to be able to come up with um, really uh, new uh, ideas or something like that. Um, so th that part is uncontroversial. Um, I think the hard and interesting question is, uh, does imagination play a role in the context of justification too? So not simply in enabling you to have the idea in the first place, but in uh, aiding you in actually testing the idea to see whether it's correct or not. Um, and of course, if, if thought experiments really provide counterexamples to generalization, then um, that means that uh, the, it, in some way the imagination does play a role in the context of justification too, because, well, the imagination, of course, is being used in the thought experiments, presumably. Um, and... Um, and if it's if those thought experiments are providing counterexamples, then then that's um, a role in the context of justification that has to do with uh, testing the correctness of a generalization, um, and in in this case, coming to a negative uh, conclusion with a counterexample. Um, so, what I want to do now is just to to say a little bit about the the general cognitive role of imagination um, and how it we use it in sometimes just ordinary life um, in something like the the context of of justification uh, because often <coughs> when people think of the 
imagination. They they think of the imagination's role in fiction and um, play um, and fantasy, uh, where the imagination is running completely um, free of, uh, or it seems free of any kind of uh, cognitive. Uh, role and so it might seem strange to think of the imagination as playing a cognitive role, um, but I think w if you consider how, for example, um, we assess um, conditional statements, um, then I think you can see that the imagination does play a significant role. So um, suppose that that you're assessing the statement that, that if TW uh, sneezes, the lecture will continue. Actually, just now I, I coughed, but um, then the, the natural thing for, for you to do, I mean, you can't, I, I don't think, as far as I know, even online, you, there probably is, isn't, uh, you know, there aren't some statistics about um, what happens in lectures when the lecturer sneezes. Um, but if you, if you, sim if you, I mean, the natural way to, to assess that statement would be um, to imagine me sneezing and then to think, well, is that the kind of thing that uh, will, will end the lecture? And I think the, and it's, it's obvious that it wouldn't, it's just a, a a trivial interruption and the lecture would continue. Um, whereas um, if you take the conditional, if TW is kidnapped by bandits, the lecture will continue. Um, you know, if you imagine me being um, carried away uh, by, by bandits, um, then the lecture would, um, would would not continue. I mean, the bandits wouldn't wouldn't allow me to continue lecturing as as they they drove me off, and and so they're just in a with a couple of somewhat random um, everyday conditionals. Uh, it seems that it, that we can quite easily um, assess them that the first is correct and the second is not. By by using the imagination. Sorry, I'm getting so, I, some interference, but um, on the sound. But <laughs> I think that's just an accident. Um, so, or, or just to take an an example, which which doesn't have to do with anything like uh, human decisions. Uh, you know, if if you um, if you take the two conditionals, if salt is put in a glass of water, it will dissolve. And if salt is put in, a, in an empty glass, it will dissolve. Um, I think that it's um, it's easy to to see that 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 if you know anything about salt and water, that the first of those uh, is correct. But if the glass is totally empty, then the salt that's put in it will not uh, dissolve. Uh, and again, I think we would we could do that just by the um, Im imagination. And uh, of course, um, in all these cases, it's possible to imagine the opposite outcome. So it, it's possible for you, for you to imagine that I sneeze and that somehow I'm so upset by my sneezing that I can't continue the lecture. And, and it, it would be possible for you to imagine me being kidnapped by bandits and somehow the bandits let me continue the, the lecture as they drive me uh, away. So you could, you could certainly, in both cases, it's possible to imagine the opposite outcome, but that's, that's not the way that we normally use the imagination in assessing conditionals. We use it in a way which is much more um, reality oriented um, and which is somehow, as we're following out the initial scenario that's given us by the if part of the sentence. Uh, in uh, the way that we expect things to happen. Um, and, and the way we do, the reason why we do this um, with the imagination rather than um, using you know, deductive logic or something is because a lot of our uh, connection, uh, or cognitive connection with the world is stored in, um, as it were, the way we're disposed to 
continued scenarios rather than in explicit generalizations from which we could deduce uh, the, the outcome. So, I mean, thinking of, of things um, a little bit more uh, abstractly, um, when we're assessing a, a conditional statement of the form, if P, then Q, uh, the typical way to assess it is by supposing P and then imaginatively developing P's likely consequences in the kind of reality oriented way that I was explaining and and then assessing Q on the imagined uh, scenario. So that we, we've got these two roles of, of the imagination here. One is, as it were, under voluntary control, which is um, imagining the P. And then we, we just decide to imagine that because that's the scenario that we're interested in. But the the other is largely involuntary. It has to do with uh, imagining what would happen next, given P. And that's where we let our sense of reality take over. Um, and, and then there's a kind of uh, heuristic uh, that, we, that we use um, it, in order to determine our attitude to the conditional, um, which is roughly speaking that we take the same attitude to the conditional um, that we take to the antecedent, the, to, sorry, to the consequent, the, the Q part, on the supposition of the antecedent, the P part. So if we accept Q on the supposition P, so as it were, conditionally accepting it, we also accept the conditional if P then Q. Um, and if we reject Q on the supposition uh, P, um, we also reject uh, the conditional if P then Q. And if we're neutral about Q on the supposition P, then we're also neutral about the conditional uh, if P then Q. Um, th this may sound rather trivial, but in fact, this, this is um, a, a very, very non-trivial uh, heuristic. And in certain circumstances, it can also be a, a problematic one. Uh, but it seems to be the way that, that we, the, as well, the way that we kind of instinctively uh, answer um, questions about conditionals wh when we don't have some special e extra kind of information, you know, like maybe somebody told us which uh, which of them is true or something. Um, and and why I think one way of seeing how reality oriented this is is that the imaginative process um, of uh, assessing. Q on the supposition P is quite similar to the real time process of assessing Q when one has just learned uh, P, for example, by being told P by uh, an informant. So, so for example, um, if, if you suddenly um, learn that um, that, you know, that some politician has been taken ill, let's say, and then you're thinking about what the consequences are. Um, I mean, you just learned it by being told it. Then the way that you develop that um, that new information is very similar to what you would do um, if you if you just imagine what would happen if such and such a politician uh, were taken ill. So that there's a strong connection between the the use of imagination in assessing conditionals and the real-time process of uh, uh, updating um, one's uh, beliefs on new information. Um, and so the, the this kind of imaginative process we have of, uh, for assessing conditionals is also um, an offline version of uh, updating our beliefs on, on new information, for example, gained by testimony. And, and this is very closely related to, to what is known in um, the work on conditionals as the Ramsey test, uh, named after Frank uh, Ramsey, who, who proposed this kind of test for conditionals. Um, and so, roughly speaking, we're, we're, we're reliable in the way that we update our beliefs uh, on new information, 
uh, when we think, what what else do I have to update if, given this piece of new information? If we're if we're good at doing that, and and um, you know our updating tends to be accurate, then um, we're likely to be um, corresponding real reliable about the acceptance of conditionals given the close relation between the uh, the two so so that those considerations uh, show uh, how um, the the role of the imagination in assessing conditionals um, is actually quite reality oriented quite closely related to updating and um, and so, it, it, there, it's not really surprising that we have the imagination playing a cognitive role, and not just a a, a role in the context of discovery, a, a role in the context of justification, because it, it's actually playing a role in assessing the correctness or incorrectness of these conditionals. Now, for the the application to thought experiments, um, we actually need to distinguish um, between different kinds of uh, conditionals. And um, I believe that this is a way um, in, in which English is uh, different uh, from uh, Chinese, particularly Mandarin, um, that what in English is shown by a difference in the the form of the the verbs it is in Chinese. I'm told, and I'm quite willing to be corrected. I'm told is is um, conveyed by context uh, rather than by the verbal form. But anyway, I'll I'll explain the distinction in uh, English, and I and I believe that a, that a similar distinction can be made in Chinese, but as I say, but by context, not by verbal form. Um, so, so one kind of uh, conditional is the, uh, what's co often called the indicative. So an example would be, if my enemies tried to kill me yesterday, um, they failed. Um, and that's obviously true because I'm alive. Here I am giving my lecture. So they did, So obviously they didn't succeed in killing me uh, because if they had, I, I wouldn't be giving the lecture. Um, there's a different kind of conditional um, called the, the counterfactual conditional, like two, um, which says if my enemies had tried to kill me yesterday, they would have failed. And two is not at all obviously true because maybe... Um, my enemies are very uh, efficient and and powerful, and so uh, if they had tried to kill me yesterday, uh, they would have succeeded. But of course, I know, since I'm alive, it means that that they didn't try to kill me yesterday. Um, so, so those two conditionals are working in in quite different ways. And the the difference could roughly be put. I mean, this this is only approximate by by saying that in some way the counterfactuals bracket actuality in a way indicatives do not. Um, so that um, when we assess one, we keep hold of the fact that we're talking about the actual world in which I'm here giving the lecture. And so, given that, it's obvious that my enemies. Uh, didn't try, didn't succeed in killing me yesterday. Um, whereas with the counterfactual, um, we we don't hold it fixed that I'm alive today because we're, we're not, as we're talking, in some sense, we're not um, bound to be talking about the actual world. We're just talking about whatever possible world it would be where um, my enemies did try to to kill me yesterday. Um, and we may grant that 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 is um, is not a and that's not the actual world. It may be some a quite uh, different uh, world, and and so with counterfactuals, there's a kind of distancing from the actual world that you don't have with indicatives, and that makes counterfactuals more suitable than indicatives 
uh, for thought experiments, because in a thought experiment, we don't want kind of interference from what's happening in the actual world. We just want to consider what um, what this what happens in this possible world, maybe a very science fiction kind of world where the the scenario holds. And uh, and so that means that that when we're trying to apply the kind of lessons that we learned about the cognitive uh, role of the imagination and assessing conditionals to thought experiments, the relevant uh, kind of um, conditionals for the imagination to be assessing are counterfactuals. Um, but, it's, but the imagination does seem to play a very significant role, at least in ordinary cases, with both indicative and counterfactual uh, conditionals. It's, it's just that it works in slightly different ways in the two cases. Um, so I, I'm now just going to um, go through a kind of ex a toy uh, example. Um, and, and so I've just, I'm going to be working with a very simplified uh, case, uh, just uh, so that the, the structure of what's going on is relatively uh, clear. Um, so I'm just going to suppose that, that we have some cl claim made by some moral philosophers and that they say um, necessarily any action is good if after it all living people feel happy. I mean, I mean I'm not, it's not that I accept that claim. I, it's just, this is a claim that, uh, as it were, a theory in moral philosophy that we're going to assess by a thought experiment. Um, and, and now here's a scenario um, that, someone who does, doesn't like that theory might come up with. And uh, this is a scenario that we're going to counterfactually suppose in the imagination. So just to keep things simple, let's suppose that there are only two people and one of them is a sadist. Um, so the sadist, in the scenario, the sadist murders the non-sadist and feels very happy about it. Um, now, what we uh, want to do um, is is to assess um, whether that action would be good in the scenario. So let's. So we're just supposing the now supposing the scenario in in a, imagination, um, and and then and we sort of assuming that scenario, imagining that's the case. Um, a judgment that we could make is after the murder, all living people felt happy. There was only one living person after the murder. That was the sadist. And so that's more or less just implied by the, um, the description of the scenario. But I think we would, you know, it seems natural to judge, but the, but the murder was not good. The action was not a good action, even though um, after it, uh, all living people felt happy. In fact, just the one living person that there was so so not good um is some is a judgment that we make um on the counterfactual supposition um of scenario it, it's a uh it, it's made on a on the supposition because it's saying that something happened after the murder but of course in in actuality there perhaps was no such murder so this is this is just made under the sum, supposition of the scenario um And, and then we apply the kind of heuristic that um, I explained uh, before to make a judgment on the, um, of the conditional. So, um, and the conditional is if scenario were to hold, not good would also hold. So that's a counterfactual conditional. And that's one that we can unconditionally accept. I mean, the, the not good itself, um, when we just make it as a categorical judgment, is made under a counterfactual supposition of scenario. But the final verdict is not made under a counterfactual su supposition. It's just made unconditionally. Um, and so, um, so we get that if the scenario were to hold, not good would also hold. Um, and this is obviously going to be relevant to um, the original claim, the original theory that we're assessing. Um, but we actually do need to be quite careful about how the relevance 
works. Um, so we seem to have a counterexample to final verdict. Um, sorry, the final verdict seems to be a, a counterexample to that claim that we were considering. But well, we have to think about how that works. Um, and the first thing to say is that the scenario is a counterexample to the claim only if scenario is possible. Because it, if, if I came up with an impossible situation where on the basis of which we judged that um, the, there was a problem for the theory. If it, if it was just in an impossible situation, that wouldn't matter because the, 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 the theory is saying necessarily, but, it's, but necessarily just means some, like, something like in all possible situations. And so we're not interested uh, in what happens in an impossible situation. We don't care about that. Um, but I think... It's pretty clear that scenario, that situation with the, the sadist and the non-sadist and the murder, um, it, it's possible. I mean, it's, it's at least metaphysically possible. It's something that could, in principle, have been the case. I mean, it doesn't mean that we could, from a practical point of view, bring it about, but, but it's, poss it, it's possible. And, um, and so since we, we had the final verdict, which said that if scenario were to uh, obtain um, not good uh, would also obtain it seems that the, the as it were the possibility of the scenario will transmit to the not good and um, and if if not good is possible then that it logically follows that claim is false because um, not not good is a case where um, there's a counterexample to claim, and so if it's possible um, for, um, to have not good, then uh, since claim is making a, a, a statement about all possible situations, it says necessarily so and so. Uh, then it, um, the possibility of not good will logically entail the, uh, the falsity of claim, which is what we wanted because we were looking for a counterexample. Um, and so we have a counterexample to claim. Um, so we were able to extract from these um, conditional considerations a counterexample to the original um, theory that we, we imagine some silly moral philosopher putting forward. Um, and there's actually a bit of reasoning that's going on here, um, which is the move from the possibility of scenario to the possibility of not good by the count counterfactual conditional final verdict. And so, um, so we've been doing a piece of reasoning which goes from some X could hold, and if X were to hold, Y would hold, um, that why also could hold, where the could, it corresponds to a claim of possibility. So the, the I mean, this, the, the, that's form of reasoning for, I mean, involving X and Y here, this, this reasoning is valid because the counterfactual condition in effect says that in every relevant possibility where X holds, Y holds, um, and so the premise X could hold that tell, gives us a relevant possibility where X holds and therefore Y also holds in that relevant possibility. So this is, this is good reasoning, but we, but, we, but we do need to think a bit about, about how exactly it's working. Um, but of course, all, all of that um, argumentation, it pushes the question back to to how we know that scenario is possible. That scenario is the initial situation with the, uh, the sadist and the non-sadist and then the murder, um, which we then make judge moral judgment about. Um, and it seemed, it seemed fairly obvious that scenario was possible, but, um, but we still need to think about how we know that. Um, 
Well, if scenario were impossible, then if it's impossible, then every counterfactual of the form, if scenario were to hold, then Z would hold, is vacuously true. That means it's true um, not for any interesting reason, but just because there, there can't be a counterexample to it because there are no uh, relevant possible possibilities where scenario holds, but and therefore there are none where scenario scenario holds, but Z doesn't hold. And um, so all we need to do is, sorry, there's a mistake in the handout here. It says identify a false scenario of that form. What we need is a false, sorry, what we should say is a false proposition, a conditional proposition about scenario of that form. Um, and I think that's fairly easy to, to find because you can have an example like if scenario were to hold, then uh, one plus one uh, equals 17 would also hold. And that's that's obviously um, false. Um, I mean, the situation where scenario holds is not a situation where uh, one plus one equals uh, 17. Um, and so we've, we've got um, a false counterfactual conditional um, of the form if scenario were to hold, Z would hold. And that means that scenario is not impossible. Um, because if it were impossible, or all the um, counterfactual conditionals which started with it would uh, would be vacuously trivially true. Um, and so, if we if we apply whatever skills we have um, in in judging uh, counterfactual conditionals to realize that this strange one, if scenario were to hold one plus one equals seventeen, would also hold. If we if we apply it to judge that that's false and we, we come to know that that conditional is false, uh, then we can also come to know that scenario is possible. Um, so given that we have the skill in assessing counterfactual conditionals by offline thinking, uh, it's going to be enough to make thought experiments work. Um, and, and that's important because I think philosophers have often thought of thought experiments as much more mysterious than they really are, as if thought experiments involved um, some strange uh, faculty that we have, which somehow it enables um, our minds to, to travel to possible worlds, as it were, or some, some weird thing of that kind. Whereas really all that's needed is the kind of skill that you need in order to be able to assess counterfactual uh, conditionals. And counterfactual conditionals, they're not something particularly philosophical or anything. They're, they're things that we use all the time uh, in, in everyday life. Um, so that if, if we have the skill to assess them, then we have the skill to do uh, these thought experiments too, in principle, uh, because it, the thought experiments don't really require anything more than uh, some skill in assessing counterfactual conditionals, uh, which seems like the kind of, as it were, a common sense kind of uh, faculty, not, not something by any means exclusive to philosophers. Um, so th that's my uh, account of how, it, you know, in a, at least in simple cases, uh, thought experiments work, how, how they can give us uh, knowledge of possibilities, um, not by any mysterious philosophical means, but uh, just by uh, our ordinary cognitive capacities to assess counterfactual uh, conditionals. Um, but I now want to, to talk about um, a, a challenge uh, to thought experiments, um, which is also relevant for this um, lecture, not only because it concerns thought experiments, but also because it concerns, um, as it were, so-called real experiments um, uh, as well. So it's so the, in, in, in a double way, it concerns the question of experiments in philosophy. So there's a, a paper uh, from 2001 by Weinberg, Nichols and Stitch, um, where people who describe themselves as experimental philosophers have 
uh, attacked the use of thought experiments in philosophy. And they have described um, using thought experiments in philosophy as they call it reliance on philosophical intuitions. So that's a very different description of what is happening in a thought experiment from the one that I've been giving, which um, didn't mention uh, intuitions, at least as as such. Um, and so I want to talk about, about this uh, critique. Um, and what they did was some uh, real life experiments where they uh, actually elicited the verdicts of medium sized samples of people, mostly not professional philosophers, often, in fact, philosophy students, but uh, on variations of thought experiments used by uh, philosophers, because they wanted to see whether the judgments that philosophers make about thought experiments are widely shared by um, other people, the judgments that professional philosophers make about them. Um, and in particular, the judgments that um, professional philosophers in the West make about these thought experiments. And I think they might add uh, male professional philosophers. Now, the results of their experiments seem to show quite a lot of variation in the verdicts that people gave on thought experiments according to uh, ethnicity and uh, gen gender, so that it, um, the people of um, Chinese or generally Eastern Asian um, origin, according to them, were responding in a different uh, way to to people in the West, and uh, uh, women were responding in a different way to men, and um, and so that suggested that the uh, kind of agreement on the right verdict to give on thought experiments, which professional philosophers had come to. Um, was just an artifact of the demography of the profession about which sort of people went into the profession. It might also be, you know, to some extent, a matter of uh, social conditioning within the profession to accept certain answers. And that anyway, that it was it was uh, being much too uh, affected by um, circumstances that were not relevant to the verdict on the on the case to be uh, reliable. Um, so that critique of the use of thought experiments is called the, the negative program of X5, X, of experimental philosophy in short. Um, so much of X5 uses similar methods to investigate uh, what you might call the contours of philosophical intuitions as well, just to find out what kind of judgments philosophers, I mean, um, sorry, what kind of judgments ordinary people make about various sorts of hypothetical case, for example, about whether some action was intentional or not. Um, not using it to criticize the, uh, the thought experiments, but just to find out more extensively uh, what uh, as where the relevant variables are, which are affecting people's judgment about um, the verdict about whether some action was good or whether it was intentional or w whether one thing, one event caused another, whatever it happened to be. Um, so w when it's not used with that critical uh, intent, the experimental philosophy is of, often known as the positive program. Um, but although the negative program might not have been the, the most common part of x Phi, it was pr the, the most high profile part because it was, calling into question a fairly central philosophical uh, method. Now, I, I would say that the, the negative program looked considerably more threatening to mainstream philosophy 10 years ago than it does uh, now. Um, and one of the main reasons uh, for that is that when the experiments were repeated um, and were done more rigorously with more attention to the kind of uh, confines of kind of things that can give you utterly misleading uh, results, which experimental psychologists are very aware of, but which uh, as were philosophers entering this area for the first time, that, I mean, they didn't 
fully realize all the pit, pitfalls. And actually, and quite a lot of that uh, work was done uh, in China, especially I think Hong, Hong Kong. Um, and, and so uh, when, um, when this, uh, these experiments were repeated and, and, or at least similar experiments, uh, they didn't find the same kind of variation on the whole. Um, and one, um, one reason why they didn't find the, uh, the original variation may be that um, the level of motivation of the, the um, the people involved uh, with the original thought experiments um, was varying uh, according to those, uh, as it were, irrelevant factors. So, for example, um, it, 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 you know, a lot of the um, Chinese students in American universities are working, um, I mean, they're doing a, a science or technology uh, major, but um, these experiment these experiments where the students were asked what they thought of these ex thought experiments, they would have been done on um, students in you know maybe an introductory philosophy class and and a whole lot of um, science or technology majors um, may have been in the class doing it as a distribution requirement in, in the, the way that uh, American degrees um, involve. Um, and so they were there not because they were really interested in philosophy, but because they had to do a f philosophy course or a humanities course. And so they, they happened to be doing this one. And, uh, and so if people are not uh, highly um, motivated, they, they tend to answer closer, at, close to, to random because they don't care, so they just write down, as it were, write down any old uh, thing to to fill the form in as quickly as possible. Um, and and it's a well known feature of psychological experiments that, on the whole, um, the the less motivated people are to answer the questions, the the closer they come to answering them at random, which is not very surprising. And so, if if most of the people of let's say Chinese origin in these classes were in fact science majors who were bored with the philosophy class. They may have been giving answers that were different simply because they, they were not motivated by the, uh, the, the questions. Um, and that would, that would show nothing about the uh, correctness or incorrectness and about of the uh, original um, judgments on the thought experiments made by philosophers. Um, I mean, there are other cases where the the similar results were obtained on retesting, but where um, people were being asked, people who had did not have philosophical training were being asked questions where the the questions involved sort of technical philosophical notions, like reference from the philosophy of language or something, and and those are those are unsafe for a different uh, reason because uh, they may not be uh, using the same notion that philosophers are using when they understand, when they read the same questions. Um, so uh, as far as I can see, the uh, on the whole, the, the new cross-cultural evidence suggests that verdicts on thought experiments often reflect something like uni universal human cognitive capacities. For example, our capacity to ascribe knowledge and ignorance to uh, other people. Um, now, I think uh, another important aspect of the critique which needs to be uh, questioned is the, the description of the, the method that was um, being used because um, the the description that the experimental philosophers gave of the verdicts on thought experiments, for example, you know, let's say the verdict that oh yes that would that would be wrong to 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 do that murder or whatever, um, 
they were, they were described as relying on philosophical intuitions. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that at the time it was so unfair of uh, experimental philosophers uh, to describe the verdicts in that way, because even people who, who were in favor of thought experiments often talked about the verdicts as philosophical intuitions. Um, but I think when you probe what's going on with thought experiments, uh, describing them in that way turns out to be extremely misleading. Um, so if we go back to the uh, example that I, I gave before, um, the, the philosophical intuition is just the unreflective judgment, not good, made on the supposition of scenario. Remember, that's the judgment that the, um, that the, the murder is bad. Uh, oh, not good. Um, so that, that judgment um, on the kind of account that I've been giving, it, it, it's just an offline application of the human capacity to make moral judgments. I mean, it, you know, if if you're actually faced in real life with the the sadist murdering the non-sadist, you would say that the that murder was bad, and and then if we if you don't, as we experience it in real life, but you just think about a, a, high, a hypothetical imagined scenario where that happens, you make the same judgment about it, but offline, and um, and that's. Just an ordinary moral judgment. I mean, it's a judgment that the, the murder is bad. And there's nothing specially philosophical about that, because it's not only philosophers who make moral judgments. Um, I mean, almost everyone condemns um, murder. It's, that's just a very, very common uh, kind of moral uh, judgment. And so describing it as a philosophical intuition is extremely misleading, because there's nothing specifically philosophical about it. Um, and in fact, if you look at scenarios uh, in thought experiments um, about um, uh, epistemological cases, then the judgment is, is often, for example, something in the form so-and-so does not know, does not know that it's three o'clock or whatever the example involves. Um, and, and saying that somebody doesn't know that it's three o'clock, that's, that's not a philosopher's judgment particularly. I mean, it's, it, it involves the word, uh, the verb know, but um, but that's just an ordinary word that we use all the time, you know. As you know, when uh, we say things like, you know, "Sorry, I didn't know that you were uh, waiting for me" or something, uh, and uh, and so you don't you don't need to be a philosopher to make a judgment like that. Um, so, and and the fact that these are made about imagined cases rather than experienced one. Is, is not really the central issue because there's, there's no special reason why our offline judgments of such cases should be less reliable than our online judgments of similar actually reported cases. And if our online judgments are unreliable, then our offline judgments uh, are likely to be unreliable too. But I mean, for example, if we're very bad at, at um, determining what's morally good or morally bad, then, then when we do thought experiments, about it, uh, we'll be bad at th th them too, but we'll often give similarly um, inaccurate answers. But that would just be a problem for human morality in general. It wouldn't be something specific to philosophy. Um, and it, it, it's not something to do with the role of imagination in thought experiments. You know, so if, if in general, if there's a domain where in real life, we're very bad at making judgments about examples of of it, then of course that will apply to thought experiments as well. But that's not the kind of skepticism that experimental philosophers intended to um, apply. They intended a, a, a kind of very specifically targeted skepticism about uh, philosophers' judgments in uh, thought experiments. But we've seen the content of these judgments really is just uh, the relevant, relevantly similar to judgments made not about thought experiments, but in real life. And it's not specifically philosophical because it's just judgments about cases and judgments using ordinary categories of, for example, knowledge and morality. Um, and uh, very similar remarks uh, apply to, uh, to other thought experiments. 
um, you know, in different areas of philosophy where the verdicts might, well, I've used words like no, that's what I've been talking about, but also intend to, you know, if people are interested in theories of action, what counts as an intended action, uh, theories of causation. And the, n- none of those are technical terms of philosophy. They're just very common words which are used in both everyday life and in many specialized uh, contexts. So th- there's, nothing, there's nothing particularly philosophical about these intuitions. And the, the, the trouble with the negative program, or one trouble with the negative program, is that it risks becoming a critique of unreflective judgment in general. Right? That because it, it, it isn't confined to thought experiments, but will the same critique, if it worked, would apply to all sorts of online uh, judgments just about particular cases that we encounter in life. Um, and in fact, the skepticism would become even more general than that because uh, it, you know, it, it's something like just a critique of unreflective judgment in general that we make about cases where we just think, oh, he, he doesn't know or he didn't intend that or whatever, uh, w- without some process of conscious reflection. Um, but even in cases of reflective judgment, where a process of, of conscious uh, reflection has occurred, they too depend on unreflective judgments for the individual steps of reflection. I mean, for, ex- for example, if you're doing a calculation in mathematics, let's say you're adding up a a whole lot of numbers, um, then that's a reflective process because you have to think about what you're doing and so on. But but each individual step that together make up this process of calculation, the individual steps themselves are not themselves um, reflective. They, uh, they, you just make them. Um, and, And so, in that way, it seems that all reflective judgment depends on um, unreflective judgment. And so if unreflective <coughs> judgment is problematic, then the reflective judgments will be problematic too, because, because the, the unreflective judgments that they're built from will be uh, problematic. And so the, the negative program risks becoming indirectly a critique of all judgment and so turning just into some kind of general skepticism. And that's very much not what followers of X5 want. They don't want to become general skeptics because uh, if they became general skeptics, that would also be a threat to science, whereas the um, experimental philosophers love natural science um, and really think that philosophy should become more like it. Um, so another problem which I want to say something about for experimental philosophy, particularly for the negative um, program, not, not so much for the positive program, um, is that the followers of X5 have not shown how philosophy could work under their restrictions. I mean, supposing that we just were to accept the restrictions that experimental philosophers um, impose, so that we that we wouldn't just rely on judgments about uh, thought experiments, um, and instead we used experimental methods to find out what ordinary people thought about um, these cases and so on. Um, so, what the experimental methods would tell us is that maybe if things go well, they would tell us that most people agree, let's say that murder is wrong. I mean, that you could presumably, insofar as these um, kind of questionnaires and so on are reliable, you can find out what, what most people think. And let's, let's assume that most people do agree that murder is wrong. Um, but the fact that most people agree that murder is wrong um, it's just a fact about the psychology of uh, people, about the, what beliefs they have. It's, it's not in itself a philosophical conclusion at all. Um, and so 
if we were interested in the the moral conclusion, I mean, supposing we're doing moral philosophy, we want to to make some determinations about which things are right and which are wrong. We're interested. We're not interested in what most people agree is wrong. We're interested in what is wrong. So, I mean, the conclu- the relevant conclusion would be uh, the moral conclusion that murder is wrong. But how do we get from what the experiments would show, which is that let's suppose most people agree that murder is wrong, to the conclusion, the moral conclusion that murder is wrong. Now, we could bridge the gap if we had the extra premise that if most people agree to a proposition, then it's true. But the thing is, what entitles us to that extra premise? What, why should we accept this, this extra premise that what most people agree on is, uh, is true? Um, and of course, we could, we could do some more experimental philosophy on that extra premise. Um, we could ask people um, what they thought about it. We could, and maybe, I don't know, but maybe we could find out that most people would um, agree that the extra premise is true. In in other words, they would agree that if a proposition, if most people would agree that if most people agree to a proposition, then it's true. Um, But um, even if we got that result, that's still just another psychological conclusion. It's not a philosophical one. The, I mean, the, the extra premise we need is uh, that, or what we need is the conclusion that the extra premise is true, but all we're getting is that most people agree to it. And, and so there's a kind of infinite regress here because, because what we need at each stage of the argument, if we're interested in the moral uh, question, is, um, is not, facts about what most people think, but just facts about what's uh, right or wrong. And so the the experiments are not giving us um, information about the questions that we're interested in. They're they're really changing the subject. They're they're giving us information about um, some psychological questions about what most people think. Um, But those are not the questions that we're primarily interested in in, for example, moral philosophy. So for all those um, reasons, uh, I regard the the negative program as a failure. Um, I don't don't think that it's cast a really serious doubt on the the method of uh, thought experiments and uh, and I don't think that it's proposing, as far as I can see, um, a, a workable alternative to the kinds of uh, method that we're using in philosophy for answering the kind of questions that we want to answer, which are not psychological questions, but are questions about a moral philosophy or epistemology or whatever it is. Um, but although the negative program fails, uh, I think maybe it does contain a real insight, um, although not not the one that the uh, experimental philosophers have have mainly uh, emphasized, but but one that that you know is a, does come up in some of their work, and. And that concerns the idea of um, error fragility. So let me explain what what that is. Um, So an error fragile method is one in which a a small error in the input can lead to large errors in the output. Um, So as it were, where, you know, if we're engaged in some kind of cognitive enterprise where one little mistake can have very bad consequences cognitively. Um, and, and I think uh, an example of um, an error fragile method um, is what we might call naive falsificationism, which is the um, a kind of maybe an unfair simplification of 
uh, Karl Popper's philosophy of science. Um, so na naive falsificationism involves rejecting conjectures uh, on the basis of a single counterexample. Now, of I mean, the naive falsificationists, I mean, they're right about the basic logical point that if the counterexample is correct, then the theory is false, assuming that the theory is some kind of um, universal generalization, then, then one counterexample is enough to show that it's false. So the, they're right about the, that basic logical point. The, the trouble is that if the counterexample relies on bad data, then the theory may still be true. Um, so if the thing that we're using as a counterexample, if that depends on some mistake that we've made, um, then we, we risk rejecting a, a true theory. And, and if we're just thinking in terms of, oh, a, a, one counterexample is enough, then um, we we may reject that true theory forever and spend waste all our time afterwards looking at various false theories when in fact we had the, the true theory in our hands, but we rejected it because of, of what we mistakenly took to be a counterexample. And so naive falsificationism is an error fragile method because one mistake with one piece of data uh, is enough to um, cause a, a cognitive a disaster where, where you, you, you reject the correct theory forever. Um, now, the, the thing to uh, observe about the standard philosophical use of thought experiments that is that the, the way philosophers have been doing it, it does involve a kind of naive falsificationism. Um, even though the, the counterexamples are coming from thought experiments rather than from ordinary experiments. So, uh, I mean, the philosophical version of this method would be that a philosophical conjecture is rejected uh, if, one thought, if one thought experiment seems to provide a thought... Sorry, that's another mistake in the um, slide. It says seems to provide a, a thought experiment, but I mean, it should say seems to provide a counterexample. Um, and so... The, the standard philosophical use of thought experiments is error fragile because we, we could reject a correct philosophical conjecture forever just on the basis of one uh, false uh, one thought experiment where you've made a mistake. Um, now, you know, I think it's important to be clear on the nature of the problem. Um, so idiosyncratic errors in thought experiments are not a serious problem. By idiosyncratic errors, I mean errors that are just one person either being a bit crazy or having a bad day or whatever, one person on a particular occasion. Um, and th that's, that's not a big problem because in, in philosophy, um, thought experiments get considered by, by many members of the philosophical community before being accepted. They're published in, um, in articles and then there's some discussion and then they may or may not be accepted as good counterexamples. So I think the just individual errors um, are, are going to be, you know, they're not going to survive um, this, that kind of filtering. So they're not the problem. Um, the, the serious problem um, is when there's an error in judging a thought experiment, which um, results from a bug in a more or less universal human cognitive capacity, because then the bug may produce agreement on a false verdict on the thought experiment. So it, the kind of error that we have to worry about is where there's as it were, something about the, the way human beings uh, think or cognize in general, not just some particular individual, um, which uh, 
produces errors. Um, and, and one thing that's um, noticeable is, is that normal uh, experimental uh, f- philosophy methods would not identify such a bug in a, a universal human cognitive capacity because um, we, if there were such a bug, we, we, we would still get agreement amongst all or most humans about the verdict on the thought experiment, but the verdict would be incorrect. Um, so the, the question is whether there could be such uh, bugs. And actually, they, they are possible. Um, because um, one way such a bug um, c- could result is, is from some kind of unconscious, innate uh, heuristic, uh, some kind of quick and easy way of making unreflective judgments which is reliable in normal conditions, but not 100% reliable. Um, and, um, and human beings um, do use um, such uh, heuristics, and we sometimes go wrong because of them. So, uh, you know, an example uh, of a heuristic that, that we use, um, I mean, not... So relevant in philosophy, but it, but it, just to, sh- to show the kind of thing is um, that in in perception um, we we often use um, color as a guide to shape, so that that where there's a clear color boundary between a red and green or something then we you know we tend to to take that as indicating uh that that that's the end of one object and the beginning of another or something like that i mean the, this is all of course but it's bound up in the workings of the the, the visual system and it's, and it's much more complicated than that but that's the basic idea and uh and of course if we use color as a guide to shape then a lot of the time that's going to give us accurate results, but sometimes it's going to, to give us uh, wrong results. Um, and, you know, and w- one way that happens is actually it's exploited by, um, by military camouflage where, where th- things are disguised by being painted in such a way that the, the color boundaries don't at all correspond to the uh, the shape boundaries and cam- camouflage works because of uh, the way the human perceptual system works. I mean, you could call it a glitch, but uh, or I call it a, a bug. But it, it 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 may in fact be that such a system is um, you know is a very good thing to have. That the heuristic that it's using is you know maybe the uh, is maybe very uh, efficient. Uh, and that the errors it produces are, are relatively uh, minor. Um, now, of course, the the, the case of um, using color as a guide to to shape um, it, that's a, a perceptual heuristic, and that one is not particularly likely to lead us into philosophical error. So, the, a further question is whether um, there are heuristics uh, which could lead us uh, into errors in thought experiments. Um, and I think, in, and unfortunately, the, the, the answer to that question uh, is uh, yes, there are. And actually, I've already mentioned one of those heuristics, which is the, um, the heuristic for assessing conditionals, uh, that to assess a conditional of the form if p then q, um, you you assess q on the basis of the supposition p, and and then you take the same attitude unconditionally to the the conditional if p then q that you took to q on the supposition of p. Now that's actually that's in general that's a pretty good way of assessing conditionals. Uh, and uh, it, 
is important for us because it exploits a lot of, um, in effect, knowledge that we have of the world, which is not in the form of explicit generalizations, but in the form of dispositions to um, to update either online or offline uh, in certain reality oriented ways. But that heuristic for assessing conditionals uh, is in fact somewhat problematic, e even though it's mostly reliable. Uh, and one can um, show that under certain circumstances, it can lead to uh, inconsistencies. I, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but uh, if you're curious about it, it, it um, the problems with it are explained in, in my book, Suppose and Tell, uh, The Semantics and Heuristics of Conditionals, which um, came out a, a few months ago. But um, the but there, what we're concerned with is a heuristic, which I think is... A, as far as I can tell, it's pretty much a human universal to assess conditionals that way. It's it's a good thing that we have it because it's mostly reliable, but it can lead to inconsistencies and therefore into uh, incorrect judgments in in certain circumstances. And and so um, it it is the kind of thing that can produce errors in thought experiments. And in fact, I, th I think that one reason why um, it's been so difficult to uh, to reach conclusions about the uh, the semantics and logic of conditionals is because um, the judgments that we're making about which conditionals are correct and which are incorrect based on this heuristic are, are not 100% uh, reliable. And so I think as a result of that, we actually have been uh, rejecting a, a correct uh, theory of um, of conditionals, which is basically that the conditional, the fundamental form of a conditional, just is uh, the truth functional conditional of um, modern propositional logic. Um, so, so the question, the question is, um, if if we're making some mistakes in thought experiments um, because of bugs in the the human universal human cognitive capacity, how are we going to uh, identify such bugs? Um, and I, I want to emphasize that I'm not I'm not arguing that thought experiments are a bad method. I think that thought experiments in general are a good method, but the, as I've been emphasizing in these lectures, I mean, all human cognitive capacities are fallible and, and the, the imagination as a cognitive capacity certainly um, inherits some of that uh, fallibility. Um, and, and so it's inevitable that Sometimes um, we will we will make mistakes. We'll make false judgments um, about thought experiments, and so it's important that we have some way of recognizing when that's uh, going on, uh, so that we don't fall victim to the kind of error fragility that I've been talking about, where we uh, reject a a philosophical theory that may be a correct philosophical theory uh, forever but on the basis of a thought experiment. But, and it would, will be, if that happens, it, it will be likely a, a thought experiment where um, in general uh, human beings uh, agree on the verdict, but that agreement is caused by a glitch or a bug in the heuristic that they're using. Of course, it, it Something that I said about the uh, the case of um, of conditionals uh, indicates one way that we may be able to uh, recognize um, that that there is a bug uh, in the heuristic that we're uh, relying on, uh, and that's because um, in in the case of the heuristic that I 
argue we're relying on in the case of conditionals, you can show that it's actually internally inconsistent. So it can't be uh, fully correct. Um, but in order to do that, one one does have to do quite a lot of analysis of just what the uh, the heuristic is that we're relying on to to formulate it to the point where you can analyze its logical properties and see whether it's consistent or not. But in other cases, it could be that that it's not that uh, that the heuristic that we're using is actually uh, inconsistent. It might, the, there might be some other way in which, in certain circumstances. Uh, it's erroneous, and we still have to be able to uh, identify those errors in order not to fall victim to error uh, fragility. Um, so I, I think uh, what we what we need um, are some other kind of uh, techniques to use in philosophy that can uh, act as a corrective when needed to, to errors that we may make in um, the, our assessments of thought experiments. And I think in general, um, well-confirmed theories about a domain help us identify bugs in our heuristics for that domain. Um, it, you know, once, once we have uh, more general theories, which you know have have quite a lot of confirmation. Then um, I think when when their support is sufficiently good, we we should be suspicious of attempts to refute them by a, a single thought experiment. And it may be that that it's the the, the general theory that is correct and the thought experiment uh, that is that is wrong. And, um, and and so such a clash can uh, alert us to the, uh, the possibility that we're making uh, a mistake. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing um, in the, uh, the next uh, lecture on Monday um, is, uh, is considering how to uh, obtain and uh, assess general theories in philosophy. In other words, uh, to deal with the problem of um, how we can compare uh, different uh, philosophical theories of the same uh, domain to decide uh, which is uh, which is better, and uh, and I think um, we, we've we've got to be willing to work at that more theoretical uh, level as well as at the level of thought experiments uh, in order to get some kind of counterbalance to the weight of individual judgments on thought experiments. So just to emphasize, I'm not rejecting the use of thought experiments. I think they're very valuable. They're an important source of evidence, but like all sources of evidence, they're fallible. And so we mustn't rely purely on the method of thought experiments. We have to have other methods uh, so that uh, when one method is going wrong, the other method can alert us to the problem. Thank you very much. So, first of all, thank you, uh, thank Professor uh, Williamson for this wonderful uh, lecture on thought experiment. I think everyone will learn a lot from uh, his um, this wonderful lecture and uh, got a lot of insightful uh, inspiration uh, from him. And uh, uh, my comments actually do not uh, indicate any strong disagreement with Professor uh, Williamson. What I did, do, uh, what I want to do in this uh, comments, prob probably it would provide a certain kind of supportive uh, evidence from Chinese philosophy and from our perspective. Then we can, uh, I, I probably will ask some uh, question, uh, clarification questions, uh, for, uh, and we want to know. Uh, more uh, information from, uh, we want to get more information from uh, Professor Williamson on uh, uh, how he think about those cases. So first of all, I think in Chinese philosophy, we also have certain kind of thought experiments, like the one uh, indicated on, in this uh, left part is kind of uh, so the, the picture of Chinese uh, philosopher Zhuangzi uh, is called uh, the dream, uh, Zhuangzi, the dream of uh, butterfly. So that indicated Zhuangzi fell in sleep and uh, 
in the dream, uh, he, he, he think he become a butterfly, but the dream is so vivid and uh, uh, make him confuse whether uh, in actual, uh, in actual world, he is uh, Zhuangzi who fell into sleep and dreaming that he transformed into a butterfly in the dream, or actually it's, it is the butterfly who uh, fell into sleep and dream, uh, but the butterfly transformed into Zhuangzi. Uh, so that is the, 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 the Chinese thought experiments uh, in, uh, uh, that is thought experiment in Chinese philosophy. So uh, arguably it can be uh, argue, uh, interpreted in various ways, whether uh, this kind of thought experiments is equivalent or similar to uh, the uh, epistemic skepticism, a skeptical scenario like random bats or some other kind of relative, uh, certain kind of thought experiments for relativism. So it's open uh, question. And uh, uh, another example I pick up is uh, uh, the right side uh, is uh, Meng Zi, uh, Meng Fusher. Uh, uh, he provides certain kind of thought experiment to indicate that uh, we have certain kind of indication uh, or certain kind of signal to indicate that uh, they're, uh, they're uh, inside us there is a certain kind of uh, say benevolence. So you, when you you can consider uh, when you see a very uh, very very young kid just in danger to fall into the well. So you 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 can feel the psychological reaction to to probably to rush the, to 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 help the kid uh, save him from the danger. So that is Chinese. Uh, I think it's a very typical Chinese uh, uh, sort of experiment in Chinese philosophy. And also, I'm quite uh, impressed by when uh, Professor Williamson's. Uh, uh, Thought and uh, thought and the online and versus offline mode of, of application of cognitive faculties, and actually we can uh, with this kind of uh, theoretical uh, uh, tools uh, in, uh, in our mind. Actually, we can give a better understanding about uh, uh, scientific research as well. So we can see how uh, say uh, so, uh, scientists design their. Uh, so, they can use a thought experiment as a tool to design certain kind of, uh, to, to make certain kinds of record pre 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 predictions. Then they can also uh, design certain kind of experimental device, try to, de uh, to detect those kind of uh, things that's predicted by the theory. If there are, there are such kind of data that observed by the uh, device, then the theory probably is confirmed. Otherwise, it's just uh, give a certain kind of uh, indication of rejection of the, the, the theory. So here's one example uh, concerning uh, the, the test of existence of the ether. And that is uh, the Michael Morley experiment. So they, they, they tried to uh, do in first step, they do certain kind of thought experiments, try to use the theory to predict that if there are uh, or there is the ether in the universe, so the lights uh, the ang uh, from the angle or will have certain kind of influence uh, among each other, and the speed of light uh, of the mo movement will change. So the second st the step, they just uh, you know. Do do certain kind of uh, real life experiment to design certain kind of experiment to test whether uh, such kind of uh, uh, significant difference should be uh, could be uh, observed, and then it, it turned out that no such significance is observed by this kind of device. So uh, the conclusion that there's no such thing like uh, ether in the universe. Uh, Ether is not a carrier of the uh, light. So we can see that this kind of uh, offline thought connects with online uh, experiments uh, go smoothly side by side to make the, uh, to, to, to their contributions to in, in science. So that is, I think, uh, this kind of uh, to, to, to offline and uh, online modes of application of cognitive faculties give us a better explanation uh, uh, of how sci uh, how to understand the scientific activity or scientific performance in a better way, I think, is a very insightful thing. Um, then I want to uh, uh, give some of my comments or ask uh, asking for certain kind of clarification from Professor Williamson. So uh, Professor Williamson tried to uh, um, give a certain kind of uh, 
argument against uh, experimental philosophy, uh, especially uh, when experimental philosophers regard the, the faculty that uh, philosophers try to use uh, in the thought experiment is the so-called philosophical intuition. So, uh, but they cannot hold this kind of thing uh, properly because the, uh, once uh, or their original purpose to provide a certain kind of critic of philosophical intuitions, but then this kind of thing will gradually become uh, uh, or have certain kind of risk to, be, to becoming a uh, uh, critic of run reflect judgment and then become an indirect uh, critic of all judgment. And so it should seem like as an experimental philosopher has to take certain kind of skeptical position uh, with uh, everyday cognitive uh, uh, judgment, something, something like that. Uh, but uh, uh, as Professor Williamson uh, indicated in his talk, the follower of uh, uh, experiment philosophy do not want to become such general skeptics uh, since they do not want to cast threats to science. Uh, but I just wonder whether this kind of thing really, um, uh, uh, I want to say, what is the real uh, real problem or what is the, the real nature of this kind of argument? Why uh, uh, the experimental philosophy would have this kind of problem like uh, they cannot they become certain kind of general skeptics. I wonder whether it's because of the, the thought, uh, because the concept of philosophical intuition. For example, if they give up this kind of idea and try to argue, uh, say some other thing, they say, okay, uh, uh, such a such a thought experiments uh, is just certain kind of say. Um, fast mode versus slow mode uh, thinking, or uh, they can also sometimes they probably can just explain, okay, that's a certain kind of, uh, uh, certain kind of cognitive, uh, cognitive faculty that, that develops throughout the human uh, evolution, something like that. And, uh, and sometime later on, I will, uh, I will give a one example concerning the, the contextualism. I think uh, probably they, they, they can just suggest that the philosopher, when philosophers do some, some, some thought experiments, they do have a certain kind of um, suspicious taste sometimes. I, I will show it, this kind of thing in a minute. Uh, so that is one uh, question. The other one is concerning the uh, infinite regress things. Uh, so from uh, if uh, uh, experimental philosopher uh, got certain data to indicate that most people agree to certain proposition and what is left unanswered is whether that proposition is really true. Um, if you want, they want to establish this, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of uh connection between agreement of the proposition and the truth of the proposition. Seem, uh, it seems that they had to uh to, to search for certain kind of exact promise, and then in order to uh, establish the validity or the, the truth of the this exact promise, probably then they have the, the, another uh, exact promise and go on and on. So that is the, the general um, uh, had a general model of uh, the argument, which indicated probably uh, ex, uh, experimental philosophy uh, will commit to certain kind of uh, infinite uh, regress problem. But I just wonder whether this, this, this kind of thing is kind of anti-psychologist approach. Uh, can, say, uh, can experimental philosophy just uh, take certain kind of, they, can they just give up the, the, the requirement for the, the truth of the proposition? Like, especially when we talk about certain kind of moral theories or social theories, can we just say um, uh, people, the most important thing is that we find out that uh, within certain kind of community, majority of people agree, agree to uh, a certain proposition because uh, certain kind of scientific reason, or we can just uh, give some other, uh, say, cultural convention on, or certain kind of uh, the way how the the, the member of the community cultivated and how they learn from the, 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 the older generation, some, something like that. And then, uh, uh, or some other, say, uh, when they, most people in the community agree to certain proposition, this group will have certain kind of evolutionary advantage. And uh, uh, the thing is that I think uh, in a quite natural way, probably we will satisfy with this kind of nature. We do not want, uh, we, we probably want to question this kind of explanation further, unless we have certain 
very strong philosophical, not interest, probably philosophical curiosity to say, oh, why the evolutionary theory is, uh, is correct, or why uh, so the, this kind of uh, uh, the, the agreement to the kind of proposition will bring the, the, the evolutionary uh, adventure to the group. Um, so, so uh, but I think, oh, according to it, this kind of a uh, infinite regress thing, it's really kind of uh, a philosophical style because in everyday life we we somehow will got certain kind of answer and become satisfied and stop asking for further one. Uh, so uh, the question is that I would just wonder because experiment philosophy is still kind of philosophy, so they they will. <laughs> You know, let's kind of uh, ask for further uh, uh, premise uh, and do this kind of a uh, thing uh, uh, endlessly, or uh, they, or whether they can have some other alternative way to to treat this kind of problem. They, they so is, so in that case, the infinite request problem is just a potential problem. It's not a real one. They just you know uh, they, they can in every in real life they, they do not have the same problem. They can stop certain uh, stage and accept certain kind of you know scientific uh, uh, explanation of uh, of just the first promise. Once they find out that the, the, the majority agreement that they, that's fine. So that's another uh, uh, question. Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, I, I think from uh, one of the suggestions is that this kind of in, uh, in, infinite, uh, uh, infinite grass, uh, the infinite grass, uh, real grass problem is kind of thing based on, uh, is kind of thing that is based upon the conceptual difference. Uh, which philosopher got very sensitive that is different between agreement to a proposition and the conception of the truth proposition. There are different concepts. We think, okay, there's a gap between them. We should find certain kind of premise to fix that or to, to bring those kind of uh, ga uh, the gap. But uh, when we try to find those kind of thing, uh, the, 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 the bridge theory or the bridge statement become, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, Suspicious. We try to justify that bridge proposition or bridge uh, uh, statement. So that is really certain kind of philosophical curiosity. Um, but uh, in every day, I think in in the most cases, sometimes we just said find we certain kind of scientific ones, and we stop to question the validity of scientific uh, 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 scientific theory when we got them as a certain kind of explanation. So that's a, my worry because uh, experimental philosophy, I think they, they are, if not all of them are naturalists, but most of them, I think, will take certain kind of naturalist view. They will satisfy with scientific one, so they are not going, they don't become the one that perform this kind of infinite regress uh, inquiries, I think. So that is the question. Um, then I want to ask uh, Professor Williamson for so further clarification concerning the thought experiment in philosophy and certain kind of supportive thing, because in most uh, part of your talk, you mentioned that the thought experiments is kind of a thing that uh, serve as a counter example uh, for uh, against a certain theory, uh, like just like what uh, Galileo did for uh, against uh, uh, Aristotle or uh, Gettier. Uh, example against uh, GTB account, something like that. But uh, in, in, in philosophy, actually, we have another style to use thought experiments. Like we use thought experiment as a certain kind of database or a certain kind of input. We think the, the phenomena indicate, indicated in the thought experiments is the information or the data we should uh, explain uh, by certain kind of philosophical theory. For example, uh, here is the very famous uh, uh, case pair uh, in uh, contemporary uh, contextualism, uh, which is designed by uh, Professor Kings de Rose, like bank case A and bank case B. So bank case A is generally speaking is very ordinary one. So uh, uh, Kings and his wife go to uh, the, the bank on Friday and find uh, there's a long line in the bank there. 
uh, since they do not have any emergency uh, thing, so they can they do not want a, a waiting line, and so they decide to come on Saturday. So the question is whether kings know that the, the bank is open on Saturday. In the in case one, which is the low stake and the low, no. Uh, out uh, relevant out of information in this case, uh, Kings could reasonably suggest that he know that the bank, uh, the bank uh, is open on Saturday because he, he just went two weeks ago on Saturday and find out that the bank was open at the time. Then we have another compare uh, case which compare with uh, case one. Uh, the case B is high state high stake and. Uh, Relevant alternative mentioned case, right? I emphasize those kind of highlight sentence uh, indicate the difference between case uh, one. Sorry to interrupt, Doctor Li, uh, Professor Li Qingbin, yeah. will, yeah. will you be shorter? Yeah, I will just finish actually. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. and this kind of thing I think uh, give a certain kind of uh, theoretical thing, uh, like uh, they want to provide certain kind of theoretical. Uh, uh, support to con uh, take a knowing as certain kind of content sensitive, but we so do have certain kind of uh, uh, debate concerning the phenomena whether the case is really uh, there, right? We, ha we have certain kind of psychological effects like uh, certain kind of framing effect, primary effect. When we change the order of the case A and the case B, probably the, the, the uh, the, the case just dissolved, or we have some other uh, explanation like psychological belief, authorized belief versus non-authorized belief to explain this kind of data. So I just wonder uh, whether, uh, what kind of, uh, whether Professor Williamson think uh, this is another way to use a thought experiment in philosophy, and uh, this kind of way, whether this kind of way is more suspicious or more uh, worrisome for us. So uh, I think that's, that's all. Thank you. At the beginning, I want to thank uh, Professor Williamson for the informative uh, lecture. I have two. I have two questions to ask. the f The first is, um, why not evaluate the role of imagination and the thought experiments in context of discovery? Um, this this question re relates to the understanding of the distinction between context of discovery and the context of the justification. To my knowledge, it is a distinction between the uh, psychological process and the logical arguments. T uh, context of discovery concerns the uh, psychological connections between thoughts. Context of uh, justification concerns only logical connections. Context of discovery is uh, descriptive. Context of just justification is uh, normative. In Professor Williamson's example, the thought experiment is a um, model argument, and the major premise of the, of the, the, the argument is a counterfactual conditional whose uh, antecedent is a scenario. Or we counterfactually suppose in, 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 in um, Professor uh, Williamson tells us the imaginative process of assessing conditionals is no different from method of thinking through possible situations. We often use in everyday uh, decision making and the, the logic of counterfactuals can explain how do we know that a uh, scenario is possible. But in normative context of ju justification, what logic tell us is that scenario is possible and we could or should know that scenario is possible. Similarly, logic tell us we could and should know how to imaginary assess conditionals. However, this has nothing to do with how imagination is used in, in making thought experiments work. It is true that a logic argument is neither mysterious uh, nor distinctive to philosophy, but it does not imply it is also true for the thinking process, which is represented by the argument. So we also need to do philosophical research on imagination and thought experiments in the context of discovery, or at least by doing so, we may find that we are not, uh, they are not um, mis mysterious. Uh, unless the relevant ph philosophical research can only be done in the context of justification. Um, the second question is how to distinguish between so-called thought experiment and the purely uh, hypothetical or imaginative reasoning. This question relates to the understanding of thought experiments. Uh, the composition of the term indicates 
that the experiment should have both a hypothetical or imagine, uh, imagine, imaginative side and an experimental side. Professor Williamson mentions thought experiments in ancient Greece, um, Indian and, and Chinese philosophy. As, as far as I know, there's a long tradition of uh, hypothetical or imaginative reasoning in Chinese philosophical texts. Many scholars in both Western and Chinese philosophy have used the category of uh, thought experiment to classify such reasoning, such as the following um, pa passage from Mengzi, Child at Well, very short, uh, but perhaps the most famous. Uh, Mengzi argued that all humans initially po um, possessed uh, these positions towards virtues virtuous feelings, and in including uh, this position towards benevolence. Um, uh, uh, for, um, Dr. Li Qilin just introduced this uh, example. Uh, the next is the original text. I, um, Meng, Meng Zi said, I, I say that all people have a heart that is not in, in different towards others because of falling, suppose, Someone suddenly saw a child about to fall into a well. Anyone in such a situation would have a feeling of alarm and compassion, not because one thought to get in good with the child's parents, not because one wanted fame amongst one's neighbors and friends, not, uh, and not because one would dislike the sound of child's cries. If it is, the, uh, if it is legitimate to say that Meng Zi used a thought experiment experiment, it will ex ex exemplify Professor Williamson's con conclusion that the role of Im imagination in thought experiments is no more special than in everyday counterfactual thinking. But as a thought, e as a thought experiment, this hypothetical or imaginative reasoning seems to lack a uh, to lack an uh, experimental side. It lacks something to examine in the sense of uh, falsely uh, fa falsification. Of course, if we add such a thing to make a thought experiment in contemporary sense, that's another thing. I think th um, this is an even more urgent question in the context of justification. Thank you. So uh, thank you both for, for, for those um points and and questions and um it's it's really nice to 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 get those um examples which i i think um from traditional chinese philosophy which i i'm very happy to classify as as thought experiments um and the the, the case of, of the um of the of the child uh, going near the the well, and w where we can, I think, can all instinctively just <laughs> start to want to protect the well, or most of us do something to pre prevent the child falling in. That's it's interesting because it's I, I mean that that case it isn't a thought experiment, but experiment, but uh, it's not particularly there as a counter example unless it, unless it's meant to be a counter example to the. Um, to some claim of, of, that you know people don't feel benevolence, but um, it, it seems more like a, a way of um, of discovering um, that that this is a, a, what is a normal human re reaction, which is a benevolent uh, one. And I think um, in, in relation to what Hong Guang was saying about it, I, I think there is an element of uh, experiment ab about it because. Um, what what we're doing is we're imagining the the scenario of the child creeping, uh, I mean, crawling towards the well, and then uh, and then we're judging. Well, how how's somebody going to feel in those circumstances? And 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 I think we can tell from our own reactions that they're going to um, their, their instinct is to is to protect uh, the child, and and so. Um, so that's, I mean, there is, a, I mean, it's a very small kind of a thought experiment, but it, but it, but it is one. I mean, after all, you know, it, it's a test of whether our reaction is a benevolent one or whether it's just amusement at the idea of the child falling into the well or indifference or, or whatever. Um, so on the, 
going back to Chile Lin's uh, comments, uh, and I, I also, uh, I mean, I liked his discussion of the, the Michael Sidbali experiment and um, and the the way in which you know, with with quite um, with ex- normal scientific experiments, um, the the imagination may also play a role. Uh, there and I, I, I think um, what one one thing that it would be useful to do is is again to separate the the role of um, what's as were the context of discovery versus context of justification because I think in some cases um, what's happening is that the imagination as it were we, we imagine a certain sort of a- experiment. Um, and but then I mean we we think of the experimental scenario and and then we can simp- simply let's say calculate from the theory what its prediction is. But I, I think um, it may and that's really context of discovery. I take it. But I, I think uh, in in many cases, w- particularly where we're d- dealing with um, theories that don't have you know just a completely mathematical uh, formulation um the extracting predictions from the theory may also involve um a a, a use of the the imagination in the context of justification by um because we're using it to test predictions of the form you know if the theory were true then such and such would happen in the in the experimental scenario and you know i think in less formal cases we we may need to uh to to do that where where it's not all you know the, the theory is isn't just completely um explicit and so i think um i mean it's not something i said very much i mean we didn't really talk about it in in the talk but i think it's it may well be true that if one explores a lot of, um, as it were, real life scientific experiments, one will will find that the imagination is playing a role in uh, assessing conditionals of the, of, you know, to do with what would be the case if the theory were true. And so I think that's I think there's a very fertile uh, area for explanation uh, there. Um, you then you were asking about whether whether we had to really had to bother or, or whether experimental philosophers would bother about the distinction between um, truth and and what people um, agree in and um, so I th- you know um, of course if somebody is a complete um, eliminativist or about morality i mean regards morality as simply some kind of illusion that, that then then they won't be interested in the the question of truth but of course even arguing i mean arguing for such eliminativism about morality itself requires philosophical argument it's not something that could just be as even if we find that lots of people ordinary people were eliminativists i don't think they are but if we did that still wouldn't be a good philosophical case for elim- eliminativism um and um you know, and I and I think um, you know, e- e- even if one has a somewhat reductionist view that that, I mean, it's it's not very like. I mean, you know, if you have an evolutionary view about uh, our morality, um, it, it's not likely to be a reduction of um, what's more what's right and wrong to uh to what people think is right and wrong it may be a reduction to to you know what's um what aids the survival of the species or or, or whatever um and uh you know and so that that would still be something where there was a difference between truth and and what people uh thought but i th- you know i think um for even some um a, Experimental philosophers may be open to the idea that there are um, er- errors in um, in the kind of morality that is generally agreed. That I mean, for example, that um, you, you know, even if uh, most people, um, you know, th- most people think that it's fine to eat meat, 
you know, it seems that that you might think there's a real question about whether we're we're simply all humans are just agreeing uh, on a certain form of treatment of animals, which in fact is morally uh, inappropriate. And and I think also, you know, the, the case of um, it, of course, morality isn't the only uh, case where these issues arise. And if if we're talking uh, about um, thought experiments in epistemology and and thought experiments, you know, in philosophy of action or uh, on theory of causation or whatever, then I think it, even for experimental philosophers, it will be it will be hard to um, to say that there's no gap between agreement and and truth. I think. Uh, I mean, they they may well want to, you know, to say that there are common illusions about, you know, about knowledge or whatever, and and so I so I think that I, I don't think they can use. I mean, I agree. Of course, they are usually naturalists, but I don't think their naturalism is going to enable them just to kind of wipe out the the bridge between um, truth and agreement. In fact, naturalists are often more willing than others to attribute error to very widely held uh, human beliefs. Um, the, the the final issue that you were raising about was about the um, the database use of uh, thought experiments, and uh, you know I think I think the database. So you were giving the example of um, thought experiments uh, which which support. Um, contextualism and epistemology, that, and um, I, I think, in a way, that that's just the other side of the the use of them for counterexamples. Because, of course, when, when we, you know, if we even on the simplest model where we're doing a kind of naive falsificationism with them, um, we're, if we're using them to refute certain theories, then. I, I mean, every thought experiment that has refuted an old theory, it, it kind of goes into our database automatically because we're we're looking for um, a better theory that will not be refuted by the the, the 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 results that we've the the data that we've got from the thought experiments which has refuted the old theories, and um, and so you know, it, and in the case of of uh, contextualism, um, if if these thought experiments work in the way that for instance, someone like DeRose wants them to work, then, then they will refute invariantism about the semantics of, of uh, epistemic terms. And, and, and then they'll support contextualism because it, it, it can supposedly, you know, explain what's going, the results of these thought experiments better. So, so I think it, it's definitely right that they have this da- database use, but I, you know, I think that's, it's all kind of, that's really making explicit something that's implicit in the idea that that, that, that uh, they can provide um, you know, potential uh, counterexamples, um, and then it, so I think there was uh, there was a quite a lot in quite a bit of agreement between us uh, there. So and then going on to um, Hong Wang's um, questions. Um, so I, I think it's a bit more complicated than just the context of discovery aligning with psychology and the context of justification aligning with uh, logic, um, because uh, the the context of of justification. Um, also has a, a a psychological aspect uh, to it because um, any kind of reasoning processes have to be um, instantiated, as it were, within human uh, psychology, and um, and I think, and in particular, in the in in the case in the case of the thought experiments, so. You were saying that it should be that logic should tell us that scenario is possible, um, but logic, um, in, at least in the in the you know the, the sense of um, formal deductive logic or something like that, 
it can't really um, do very much about possibility. I mean, we, we may we may be able to to show that a certain scenario is logically consistent, but that doesn't really mean that it's possible. So, for example, you know, if we take uh, the case of Phosphorus and Hesperus, which are just two different names for the uh, for the planet v- Venus. Um, if we take the claim that Hesperus is um, distinct from Phosphorus, um, th- that that claim is logically completely consistent because logic, logic as it were, doesn't know whether those are two names for the same object or not. It, uh, um, and uh, and and in fact, it, although it's logically consistent, it's it, it's not something which is regarded as objectively possible. I mean, for you know, by the, for example, Kripke's arguments in, in naming and uh, necessity. And so, I think a lot of our judgment—I mean, our judgments of uh, what's uh, possible and our judgments um, of um, of conditionals as well. Um, th- Although logic has a role to play in that, I think with many of the conditionals I was talking about in the lecture, um, logic will not help you to decide very much about whether they're true or not. I mean, and it's not, it's, it, well, in the case of the, the one with scenario I was talking about, I mean, the, the, the key judgment was that the murder was 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 bad. But um, the... I mean, it's it's not pure logic that tells you that murder is bad. It's it's something much richer, w- which has a rational side, but also has a, a psychological um, side. Um, uh, uh, and so I, you know, I I think that, um, and and even in, of course in the context of discovery, um, I think as you know, philosophers of science have, have emphasized. I mean, it's, it's not as though um, rationality is completely absent from the, the discovery uh, side. It, it, it's often there are the thought processes that lead to, as it were, the, the having an idea are often themselves rational processes. So I think it's a, the, the relation between, um, as it were, the psychological side and the rational side is, is quite complex, uh, in part because human rationality, you know, as it were, has to be psychologically uh, realized. Um, and, and then on the, on the second uh, question, um, so that was about the relation between thought experiments and uh, hypothetical uh, thinking. And I'm not drawing a big distinction between those those two. Um, so I think that hypothetical, I mean, thought experiments involve hypothetical thinking of a, um, you know, of, of a rather uh, developed kind. I mean, there can be examples of hypothetical thinking, which is so um simple that, that we wouldn't really describe them as, a, as thought experiments. But I think that's just a, 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 a matter of, of complexity. And then, it, you know, well, I said, I think I said something about this uh, earlier, but that it, in, in relation to the, as well, the experimental side, um, I think that just has to do with um, the, the judgment that we make about the consequent of the the conditional. I mean, for example, that you know, and it might be something like, "I I would, I would want to save the child" or something like that. But um, it, so it, it it's not. It doesn't have to be a very elaborate experiment. It's just it's just that there's a further judgment which is elicited what, when we. Um, imaginatively suppose the the antecedent uh, of the of the conditional and which is not just as it were a, a mechanical uh, logical uh, consequence of it or an obvious logical consequence of it okay uh, thank you